Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Kevin Quigley. I'm the director of the McKechnie Institute of Public Policy and Governance. Thanks uh, so much for joining us for a discussion on uh, water policy today. So uh, on today's business, I'm going to take a minute to discuss the genesis of this panel. About three years ago, the Canadian Water and Wastewater Association asked me to help them understand their risks better. So with the help of the Centre for Security Science, the Defence Research Development Canada and Public Safety Canada, we sent to work on developing a risk profile for the sector. So I asked Dr. Calvin Burns to work with me on the project, as well as uh, Gwen Moncrief gould who was actually in this policy class two years ago and is now living in Ottawa and perhaps is listening to us online, I'm not sure. And Warren McDougald also from the McKechnie Institute has worked with us on this project. What became obvious very, er, very early on in the project, while we can study perceived risk at the firm level, water supply is situated in a context underpinned by various technical, market, environmental, cultural, social, psychological, legal and political challenges that accompany the effort to provide drinking water to people in this country and around the world. In order to understand better the policy challenges associated with water, we need to take a tight lens to examine the individual water service providers. We also need to take a broader look at trends and contextual pressures in the sector as a whole. So with that in mind, I'm delighted to say that we invited a group of distinguished thinkers on the subject of water supply to help us to animate this policy discussion today. We'll start with Dr. Calvin Burns, who will summarize our initial findings of risk perception among CWWA members, which is the Canadian Water Wastewater Association, CWWA members. And then we'll expand the discussion to examine water supply on First Nations, and then go beyond our borders to examine water issues in different parts of the world. This comparative perspective will hopefully shed new light on how we treat water at home, and a perspective on our responsibility to help provide the essentials of life to others on the planet, and the complexity at times of doing just that. So as is the custom, I'll introduce uh, the speakers uh, just before they speak. Um, um, and I will start with, uh, with Dr. Calvin Burns. So Calvin Burns, uh, Calvin and I have uh, collaborated together for a number of years on a number of uh, different risk issues. So this was a, 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 an energized partnership, I would say, to start with uh, when we started this project. Calvin Burns is an industrial psychologist um, at the University of Strathclyde, UK. Dr. Burns' research centers on how risk perception and trust attitudes influence risk decision-making and risk-taking behaviors in predominantly high-hazard organizations. So uh, I'll pass it over to you, Calvin, who will summarize our results from our study before we uh, open up discussion to others. Calvin. Thanks. Thank you, Kevin. Um, good morning. Um, as Kevin mentioned, I'm going to speak about some of the, some of the work that Kevin and I did um, so I'm going to tell you about uh, attitudes and perceptions about uh, risk resilience and security in water utilities. Um, risk is traditionally understood from an engineering or management science point of view as likelihood times severity. Um, Usually people from the rational actor approach uh, talk about real risk. They're, they're looking at the number of adverse events that have occurred, at the number of accidents, the number of injuries. Sometimes um, they use theoretical models like quantitative risk assessments or human reliability analyses to, to estimate risk. Well, as a, as a psychologist, I look at perceived risk um, because risk can mean different things to different people. And what risk perception is, is it's the study of beliefs, attitudes, judgments, feelings towards hazards and the, the risks associated with them. And that, that's what I'm going to focus on. Why is perceived risk important? Well, risk perception is a basis for risk acceptance. Um, as a psychologist, I'm interested in being able to predict and explain human behavior in a, a number of different contexts. So looking at how water utility personnel perceived risk is going to give me an indication of their future risk-taking or uh, risk-mitigating behaviors. So what we did was we conducted a questionnaire survey, as psychologists do, to measure um, attitudes and perceptions about risk um, uh, and, and, and security. So the, the method was we used an online questionnaire um, with our partners at the CWWA, they distributed the, uh, the link to, uh, to their members. Um, we received uh, more than, uh, responses from more than 140 water utilities from all, uh, all 10 Canadian provinces. 
Um, we had 352 individual responses. 73% um, were male, which is probably reflective of the, the demographics of the, the water sector. I wouldn't necessarily say we had a representative sample of all, um, uh, of all utilities across Canada, but we had a good representative sample of small, medium, and large utilities across Canada. 45% um, of our sample were senior managers, and of the remaining 55%, most were managers, operational field staff, or technical support staff. Um, so how did we measure risk perception? Uh, the C, uh, CWWA and Public Safety Canada gave us details about hazards, threats, defenses um, that were important to security and risk resilience. Some examples of those hazards were unauthorized access to premises, um, hacking, flooding, insider threats, loss of power, severe storms, contamination of the water supply. Um, we also asked about defenses and systems, so you know, fences and external barriers, intrusion detection software, SCADA systems, employee ID cards. And this is normally what happens when you do a risk perception study. Um, uh, usually we find two main factors of, of risk perception. Um, the first factor is dread, or how afraid somebody is of the, the hazard, and the second factor is the, the unknown factor. How much do we know or don't know about, uh, about the hazard or its long-term effects? Um, we didn't take this approach because I didn't really think it was going to tell us anything. I mean, if we asked about uh, cybersecurity, things like hacking, well, people might say, people would probably say, yeah, we're somewhat afraid of it, and, well, we, may, we maybe don't know a lot about it, so we might see uh, you know, attitudes and perceptions about hacking uh, coming into this, this bottom right-hand quadrant. But if we asked something about aging infrastructure, people would probably say, well, I'm not really afraid of it, um, and we know a lot about it, we might find, we might find it down here. So we, we looked at, we, we tried to take a more traditional approach, uh, looking at the, the likelihood time severity aspect, um, and so we tried to measure people's likelihood ratings and their severity ratings, um, as my colleagues will attest. Uh, from what we were talking about last night at dinner, how you ask a question will very much determine the response that you get. Um, so, so some of the some of the things are we, we ask people um, for each of the following hazards and threat, threats. Think about the defenses and systems that your water utility has in place. Then rate how likely. Um, security at your water utility is to be adversely affected by these hazards or threats. And we gave them things like flooding, you know, severe storms. And we also asked them about their defenses and systems. How likely are the defenses and systems to be breached at your water utility? And we asked people to rate these on a five-point scale, looking uh, from highly unlikely to highly likely. We then did severity ratings, uh, following a very similar thing. Um, how severe could a security breach or incident uh, be to your water utility from the following hazards or threats? And how severe could a security breach in the following defenses and systems be to your water utility? And again, people made responses on a five-point scale from negligible to extremely severe. So we are looking to produce something like this. And this is a standard risk profile or, or risk matrix where, whereby you know, things in green are things that you really wouldn't worry about. Things in the yellow would, would, would uh, represent active risk management. Things in red are you know, intolerable or intolerable where, where uh, drastic action is needed. So when I plotted the data, this is basically what we had. Um, risk is usually expressed as a probability uh, or, or um, ranging between 0 and 1. Um, and uh, we, we can see here, I think there's about uh, 18 or so different different hazards, uh, hazards and threats and systems um, on here. We can see, you know, the the risk of earthquake seems to be quite low in terms of likelihood. The the impact somewhat middling. Uh, we we see the highest um, the highest risk is coming out from aging infrastructure and severe storms. But this this is a bit of a mess. So what, what I did, I mean, it's, it's hard to kind of interpret what goes with what. So I did something called a factor analysis. 
And what that is, it's a statistical technique that reduces all of these data points into more co a smaller, a smaller set of groups. Um, how, how do the, what risks go with what? Um, so when I did that, I found five main factors of, of risk perception. Um, so this is a little bit easier to interpret. So the, the five main factors we found were infrastructure-related risks, things like aging infrastructure, storms, um, risks to the water supply, think source water contamination, drought, um, risks of physical access, uh, cyber-related risks. And then, then I, I, we had another factor that I wasn't quite sure how to interpret. I called them other uncertain, uh, other uncertain risks. Um, this, this contained, um, I can't remember off the top of my head what, uh, what it contained. Um, uh, I think things like, uh, uh, that's it, extreme, extreme weather and um, insider threats. So. Um, and, and so you can see how, how they were plotted on the, the likelihood time severity uh, grid. Um, but I also, uh, I also calculated the, the, the risk scores, took the, took the likelihood score and multiplied it by the severity score. And basically what you can see is, I mean, the, these scores could range from zero to one. Um, infrastructure related was the highest risk, but I mean, it, it still didn't come out. Um, People weren't overly concerned with it. We, we had a risk score of 0 0.38. Um, so how, how do these risks stack up? Well, infrastructure-related risks were statistically <coughs> higher than the other four risks. Um, risk score for uh, water supply was higher than uh, physical access, cyber, and other uncertain risks. Um, and we didn't find we didn't find any difference between uncertain risks and physical access, um, uh, um, and other uncertain risks what what was was lower than 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 all of the others. Um, I was expecting to find differences between senior managers and the rest of the workforce. This is consistent what we see in the wider occupational risk literature. We didn't find any differences in this. I wouldn't say it's good news or bad news, but it suggests that everyone within the, the water sector seemed to share the same mental model of risk. Um, senior managers understood risk as uh, in the same way that uh, members of the frontline workforce did. And we also compared water utilities by size of population. And basically what we found was that um, the bigger the water utility, the more, uh, the more they were concerned with physical access, cyber related, and other uncertain risks. So what, do, what are the implications of, of, of our findings? Well, our findings, these risk perceptions are valid in the sense that um, they, they, they will influence employees' risk acceptance and their security-related uh, behaviors. But if there is a disparity between their perceptions and the actual number of, of security incidents or theoretical estimates of adverse events, for example, cyber-related risks weren't perceived very highly, um, well, then this, this suggests that there's uh, perhaps better risk communication is needed about these risks to the... Um, from, from perhaps regulators uh, or Public Safety Canada to, to operators. It also suggests in terms of REN's risk uh, rationality that we need to think about how we manage these risks differently. Um, uh, complex risks like infrastructure-related risks, water supply, physical access, we, we know how to fix broken water mains. That's kind of easy to do. Um, engineers have a lot of experience with that. However, for things like uncertain risks, we don't have a lot of reliable data um, or a lot of experience dealing with these. So the, the implications for how we learn about how to deal with these risks um, are going to be very different. So that's, that's kind of the big message I want to kind of leave here is that, yeah, we did find five different, uh, 
five different factors of, or five different types of perceived risk with respect to water. Um, and we can think about them in terms of them being a complex risk or, or an uncertain risk. And I'll leave it there. Alida Bardawaj is a toxicologist at the University of Saskatchewan with expertise in human and environmental health risk assessment. She is committed to finding solutions for and understanding issues associated with inequitable access, supply, and provision of safe, sustainable drinking water supplies for First Nations, rural, and remote Saskatchewan communities. Hi, everyone. Okay, I have my watch here. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to acknowledge um, that we are in Mi'kmaq Key, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. I'd also like to thank Kevin for the invitation um, my colleagues, and I would like to thank you for um, attending. I look forward to your questions. So when we think about water security and water, it means different things for different people. And I think um, to understand how we manage risk or perceive risk of water and water security and manage it, we need to understand the different perspectives people have on the meaning of water and water security. For some, like our Indigenous people, water is life, water is spirit, water is very sacred. It is the blood vein of our Mother Earth. For some, water is a commodity. It is something that we buy and sell. And it is also recognized for its functionality. And perhaps when thinking about water as a commodity, it may have lost its human, social, and cultural dimensions. So when we think about risk perception of water and water security and the management of it, we have to consider the perspectives of different people. Okay. Now, you don't have to go too far to, um, into the media and into the newspapers to see the issues around access uh, to safe drinking water in First Nations communities. I'd like to express that um, First Nations are 90 times more likely to have no access to safe drinking water, that 30% uh, of water systems in First Nations communities are considered high risk, and as of September 2017, there are 160 and one, boil water advisories that have been long-term in First Nations communities. Long-term boil water advisories are those that are greater than one year in duration. And when we consider public health implications of a boil water advisory, it is advised when you have a boil water advisory not to bathe your children because of the potential to be exposed to a hazard in the water um, as a result of bathing the child. So just think about that. Now, governments um, in Canada have uh, basically addressed um, issues for First Nations communities through the First Nations Water Management Strategy and have implemented six major strategies over a, a 10 or 12-year period from 2001 to 2013 with the culminating event of the passing of Bill S-8, which allows the government to create regulations for uh, First Nations um, drinking water. So our partners asked us, you know, what, how, how is this progress, how has government been doing and how has progress been made? So what we did was we looked at um, the progress reports related to these uh, six major initiatives. And we found that um, within these reports, there were four major indicators utilized to uh, um, sort of gauge success. So what we found was that um, proportion of high-risk communities removed off that list was considered as an indicator of success. The um, dealing with priority communities that were identified, there were 21 priority communities identified that required immediate action um, in 2006. And um, these priority communities were um, classified as priority because they were under a long-term boil water advisory and their water system was um, at, um, categorized as high risk for human health. The next indicator looked at the proportion of operators that were certified. 
and the number of communities with maintenance management plans. Now these indicators were quantitative and we looked at, and we tried to look at the data that reflected the success utilizing these indicators. And what we found um, over the term of this 12 year period was that there was some success. However, when you look at um, the number of high priority communities taken off um, that list, we found that a consultant report in 2011 by Negan Bernstein the, that conducted the assessment revised the government findings from the previous year. And in fact, we saw a decline of those high-risk systems um, or an increase in the high-risk um, system percentages or the proportion. We also um, noted that there was an increase in the number of trained um, operators, but this may demonstrate that there was an implementation of the circuit rider training program but we found, working with water treatment plant operators in First Nations communities, that operators are really difficult to retain. For example, water treatment plant operators express that they hadn't had holidays for seven years because there is no one to take their place, and that some municipalities, once the operator is trained, entice the First Nations water treatment operator to work with the municipality because they get paid more. Also, we noted that a uh, um, maintenance management template became available in 2010, um, and there was increased reports that these maintenance management uh, plans were put in place in First Nations communities. However, we don't understand whether or not they are um, operational, implemented, and are followed within the community. So are these indicators really um, measuring success. So what other indicators do we need to indicate that there's going to be or could be success in First Nations communities? We also have to understand that water supply systems are very diverse in First Nations communities. We have water distributed systems, we have truck to cistern systems, and we also have wells that access groundwater. So in order to understand the risks perceived by First Nations communities, we have to understand the water supply system itself, and we have to understand the risks within that water supply system to manage those risks. And you can see from this picture that um, we did a study that looked at the water treatment plant um, and a truck to cistern water supply system in, in two communities in Saskatchewan, and what we, what we found was that there was contamination across the supply chain. And I'm just going to present some ex results here. Um, so what we found was that there was significantly higher risk of coliforms in trucks during late summer. So there was a seasonal aspect to potential risk of coliforms. We also found that there was significantly higher risk overall of coliforms in cistern-served houses um, versus piped distributed houses. And we also found that there was significantly higher risk of coliforms in houses during late summer. So we found that there was a significant difference in terms of risk in a, tapped, uh, a distributed system versus a cistern system and those that are, are in, in a, wa a truck to cistern water supply. Now in 2016, in October actually, um, we, uh, we held an Indigenous water forum and we asked water treatment plant operators and community members from various communities across Saskatchewan to place issues and challenges in three categories, as important, very important, or very important and urgent. And what we found, we found 18 major important issues in these communities. But I'm just going to highlight four main ones. And one of the things that we were hearing is that we need to um, really coordinate efforts for water protection. And this involves coordination among all people within Canada, nationally. That there is a movement to unite Indigenous people in Canada for better water management and to plan for uncertain risks. And in Saskatchewan last year, we had an oil spill. Thank you. So this was an uncertain risk that wasn't planned for in terms of water supply. Building relations around, among people engaged in water management and policy making 
and also to increase um, communication and transparent communication. So we also um, talked to several water treatment plant operators, and what we did was we looked at the problems from the individual at the reserve level, at the provincial, federal level, as well as through time. And what the water treatment plant operators were telling us is there's a lack of money and physical capacity at the level of the reserve. And this speaks to maintenance issues, water supply, water infrastructure issues, and long-term planning as a result. And this quote um, really depicts that. And also access to um, um, parts for maintenance. We also looked at solutions. What are some positive solutions moving forward? And when we look at forward-looking solutions, we um, talk about, or they talked about long-term planning. Let's not just make a water treatment plant for today, but let's plan for the future so that it meets capacity. So it can functionally operate and, and um, feed the community for generations. And again, this quote speaks to that long-term plan. They also indicated increased communication and building relations and improved relations with the stakeholders involved in management, First Nations, um, government, and the province. So across those levels, from the individual to the reserve, federal, and provincial. So there, there is an understanding of the diverse perspectives on the meaning of water and water security for different people within our country. So moving forward towards water security, acknowledge, respect, diverse views, understand risk to inform risk management solution for decentralized water systems, and building relationships, partnerships, and improved communication for co-developed solutions for better management strategies for our First Nations communities. Thank you. Mark de Villiers is a veteran journalist and the author of 15 and counting books, the most recent being Back to the Well, Rethinking the Future of Water, published in the fall of 2015. In 2016, he was shortlisted for the 2016 Donner Prize for Best Public Policy Book by a Canadian. He has won several awards for his work and is currently working on The History of Hell. I can't wait to read that one. Okay, Mark. Well, I'm uh, the only panelist here with absolutely no uh, academic expertise or uh, technical expertise, so I'm going to give you, as much as I can, a fast overview of, uh, of the global water situation, and uh, I have to be pretty sketchy because the, the world's a big place in 10 minutes. So let me start this. I, in, in, when I was writing my first book on water in 2000, uh, 1998, I attended a conference in Paris uh, organized by UNESCO, um, and during the first day, a Spanish hydrologist called Ramon uh, Madurga really annoyed all of the delegates by saying, asking this question. He said, this conference is called Water, the Looming Crisis. Well, I've been attending conferences for 20 years, he said, and always they say, Water, the Looming Crisis. And why isn't it looming? Why hasn't it loomed? Good question. The discussion went on from there. Now, in 2003, I attended a second conference, this time in Costa Rica, and guess what it was called? Water, the looming crisis. <laughs> it still hadn't loomed, right? Anyway, so one more ex example. In Edinburgh in 2012, the International Water Resources Association had a water conference. The title wasn't Water, the Looming Crisis, but one of the main themes of the conference was, guess what? Water, the looming crisis. So what's going on here? Is water a crisis or not? And I think Ramon Madurga was both right and wrong when he said, uh, he asked that question. He was right in the sense that there is, in fact, no single global water crisis. Uh, not like air pollution, where if somebody pollutes the air, it spreads across the globe, and you've got a, a global crisis. Water, on the other hand, is susceptible to literally thousands of small local regional water, basis, uh, water basin uh, uh, crises, all of which have to be solved locally, uh, maybe a finance from abroad, but all have to be solved locally. Um, and this makes solution to water issues, in my view, uh, 
easier rather than harder. Uh, but it, you have to remember that this water, uh, uh, conserving water in Boston, for example, which they've done extra, extremely well, doesn't get a drop to Haiti. Um, uh, Ontario uh, can conserve as much water as it like. It's not going to help Yemen. Um, uh, even water, good water management in Germany is not going to help anybody more than a time zone away, only the Germans. Mali's problems can't, uh, are not catastrophic for Haiti. Haiti is not catastrophic for Bolivia or for Lubbock, Texas. Indeed, there are many parts of the world where there are, in fact, no water crises. None of which is to say that the water world is in good shape. Uh, plainly, it's not. Uh, what the World Bank uh, calls the dismal arithmetic of water can be divided into two, sorts, two sorts of issues. The crisis of contamination, that is pollution, and the crisis of supply, that is the raw water resource itself. In many places, of course, these two uh, sets of crises overlap. I'm not going to depress you with too many issues, but here's a, f a quick sketch of, of, of some of the problems facing the water world. Uh, on the, on the pollution issue, virtually none of the world's major rivers are any, any longer fit to drink in their wild state without treatment. Uh, here's a piquant one. Uh, suntan oil from too many millions of bathers along the south of France is now a serious pollutant in the Mediterranean and is one of the toxins killing off the sea urchins. There's just too many people slathering too much stuff on too many bodies. Somewhere in the world, a child still dies every six to eight seconds from drinking contaminated water. This adds up to about five million a year. A decade ago, Peter Glick of the, of the Pacific Institute suggested that uh, if water and sanitation services across the world didn't improve radically, as many as 135 million people a year would die from water-related diseases over the next 20 years about the same number as those killed in all the, war, all the wars of all of human history. That prediction sounded extravagant, but it actually came true. That many people did die of waterborne water diseases a decade ahead of Glick's schedule, and so on and so on. On the supply issue, to take just one example, in China, satellite pictures show hundreds of lakes and rivers disappearing, going dry, as aquifers diminish and springs cease to flow. Uh, in the 1950s, the country, China, had 50,000 rivers. True enough, many of them were small, with catchment areas not more than 100 square kilometers. But even so, by 2010, the number was down to 23,000 rivers. China had lost 27,000 rivers entirely. Water tables are dropping everywhere in Bangladesh, the Middle East, Western America, China. On the North China Plains, uh, water tables are dropping at a better than a meter a year. And yet, when I was there uh, five years ago in Shinsuang, a small, a small by Chinese standards, a small to medium-sized city of two million inhabitants, developers were advertising waterfront property this is on the, on the fringe of the Gobi Desert, by the way. Advertising waterfront property on lakes filled with pumped groundwater. It's insane. Nevertheless, with all these problems uh, examined, are they solvable? All of them are solvable. It's not to say they will be solved, but they can be solved, and some of them are being solved. In each case, the real question is the degree to which these problems are uh, a factor of natural constraints, that is the actual water, and in which case the limits are real and fixed only with substantial effort. And yet how much is, and on the other hand, how much is due to poor management and policy, in which case, of course, the remedy is obvious, if rather elusive, since good management, as we can plainly see from the state of the political world, is in hard premium in our times. A case in point, Pakistan, a country already an exceptionally dry place, has built only two large storage dams in the last 40 years, and those are already in trouble due to excessive silt through the same period. India in the same period built 4,000 dams, and China an astonishing 22,000 dams. 
Pakistan's dams store 30-day supply in, in drought conditions, India's 120-day supply. Even in Yemen, which, by the way, is likely to be the first country anywhere in the world to run out of water altogether, the problem is being caused mostly by a profligate use, corruption, and mismanagement. So we need to approach solutions through both of the obvious paths, working in concert. The path of the engineer, that is, major infrastructure projects, bulk water transfers, dams, desalination, and so on, and the soft path, that is, don't increase the supply, reduce the demand instead. A couple of quick examples. Uh, about a decade ago, when I was filming in Namibia, the capital city of Namibia is called Vintuk. Um, I was at a plant, and a water manager gave me a tumbler full of water and said, drink this. This is recycled sewage. So what are you going to do? Um, it would be churlish not to drink it, so I drank it. And of course, I knew how safe it was because N Namibia had become the first major city anywhere on the planet to fully recycle all of its water, including sewage, into drinking water. Can be done. And a number of other jurisdictions have followed. Um, Singapore now gets about 40% of its drinking water from uh, recycled sewage. Uh, they rather delicately call it new water rather than recycled sewage to, uh, uh, so as not to offend delicate sensibilities. Uh, but uh, uh, another example, desalination, which has always been criticized as a, as a water hog, has become much more efficient uh, now. Israel is now getting all of its drinking water from desalination techniques. And uh, uh, a group of scientists from University of Manchester have developed an e a much less energy intensive version of desalination using cheaply made graphite, graphene oxide as a sieve, therefore making desalinating the seawater both scalable and efficient. Two more quick examples before that I get the hook from our lady in front here. Um, you may remember a year or so ago that uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation launched what they called a Reinvent the Toilet Challenge. Uh, one result among many was a thing called the Blue Diversion Device developed by Swiss scientists, a dry toilet that needs no piped water and no wired in electricity. As the writer Sally Tisdall wrote in a piece for Harper's, it has been thoroughly tested by its end users. Her pun, by the way, not mine. Um, a pilot project in Nairobi is currently using 27,000 27, people uh, every day. China has commissioned the construction of 16 sponge cities to pilot, sol to pilot solutions for freshwater scarcity and flooding developed in many cities as a result of urbanization and increasingly heavy rainfall. Uh, one more quick example. Ford engineers have now created a simple device that collects condensed water from automobile air conditioners and recycles it through a spigot into drinking water inside the car. This is, and it was already well known uh, that driving in hot conditions with your air conditioner on is already more uh, uh, environmentally positive than actually turning the air conditioning off and driving with the windows open. And my time is now up. I, uh, it's a very quick sketch, a sketch of what's going on in the water world, and we can talk more about it in a while, if you wish. Thank you. Francesco Sindico is co-director of the Strathclyde Center for Environmental Law and Governance and program leader of the Strathclyde LLM in Climate Change Law and Policy. Dr. Sindico's work focuses on international water law and policy with a special emphasis on transboundary aquifer law and policy an area in which he's been collaborating with leading uh, international organizations in Southern Africa, Central America, and South America. Thank you very much. First and foremost, I would like to thank uh, Kevin and the McCachan Institute for inviting me here at this very, very interesting panel. Uh, what I would like to bring to the debate is a focus on groundwater within the context of global water security and an international law approach. It's important to look at all the water aspects and a multidisciplinary perspective. So the law is part of the puzzle, if you want. 
And because sometimes we talk too much and we don't arrive at the conclusion, let me give you immediately the two key messages of this brief talk. The first one is that if we look at water security at a global and transboundary level, we really need to fully take into account the potential of groundwater. It goes without saying, obviously, that we have to understand groundwater. But groundwater plays a very important role. And the second key message is that we often think that countries and territories like Canada here or Scotland where I work do not really have problems about water. It's, it's, it's everywhere. It's plentiful. We already have seen that that's not always the case. But I want to highlight that from an international law perspective, water-rich countries do have a role to play when it comes to global water security, both here and in countries that are under water stress. But let me start discussing a little bit more about groundwater. Now, our previous speaker, Mike, has highlighted, and well done on doing it in 10 minutes, all around the world, <laughs> big problems. So these are figures that we usually see. 663 million people lack access to safe drinking water sources. Another really, really daunting figures, which, however, by the way, are somewhat better than just 10, 15 years ago. They're definitely not a good thing to see, but they are somewhat better. Now, a lot of these problems focus on the soft side, I would say. It's about governance a lot of times. But having said that, in many dry parts of the world, it's also about finding the water, about accessing water. Where do we find the water? And this is where groundwater becomes really, really important. Because what you have here is the amount of freshwater stored surface water. So wetlands, large lakes, reservoirs, rivers. This is the available freshwater. Compare this with the amount of groundwater. Some figures put groundwater to up to 98% of available freshwater resources around the world. It goes without saying that it's, if you're dealing with global water security, you better start understanding groundwater. And if you think that in terms of extractive industry, oil is the most extractive natural resource in the world, think twice. Groundwater surpasses oil 200 times around the world. So groundwater is a relevant issue. And if you start looking at groundwater beneath two countries, then things get even more complicated. There are, as of today, we identified 276 transboundary surface water basins. Since 1820, you have 400 agreements on the Nile, the Danube, the Mekong, you name them, lakes between Canada and the US. You also have, at the international law level, a treaty, a legally binding instrument within the UN family, the UN Water Courses Convention that was signed in 1997, entered into force in 2014, that sets the rights and obligations of countries when they share a river. Do we have a similar pattern when it comes to groundwater, when it comes to transboundary aquifers? Not really. We actually have many more transboundary aquifers. And the number is up and counting. We've had 592 transboundary aquifers around the world, several of them between Canada and the US. But we only have, as 2017, four agreements in force. I'll show you which they are. Only four, and two are waiting to enter into force. And not only that, but we don't have a treaty. We don't have hard, legally binding law. We have a set of, I'll call them, guiding principles adopted by the United Nations International Law Commission on the law of transboundary aquifers. Very dry regions of the world, such as Africa, have a lot of these aquifers. It's very important. Now, these are, on the slide, the four aquifers that are currently regulated. You have the Guarani aquifer system in Latin America, shared by Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay, and Uruguay, which I can expand on in the debate. I have worked quite a lot on that specific aquifer. In Northern Africa, you have the Nubian sandstone aquifer system, which I'll mention in just a second, and the Northwestern Sahara aquifer system. In West Africa, you have the Ulamedan. In the Middle East, you have the Aldizi, the Dizi aquifer between Jordan and Saudi Arabia. That's the most recent one with an actual in-force agreement. 
And in Europe, you have a very small aquifer, the Genovese aquifer between Switzerland and France. But let me focus only on one. This is the Nubian sandstone aquifer system. It's a huge aquifer in one of the driest parts of the world. It's shared by Libya, Egypt, Chad, and Sudan. A few characteristics are worth mentioning here. This is a fossil aquifer. What that means is that once you mine it, once you extract water from it, you don't have any more. It's not replenished. It's not recharged. And it goes without saying that any aquifer of these characteristics needs a specific, very cautionary management approach. Because once you've finished with it, there's no going back. This is governed in a way by law. There is some sort of an international agreement, but it's very minimal. The, really, the only thing it does is sets up an obligation to exchange information. Much more detailed uh, rules about pollution, about management practices, about sharing the water. That's not present there yet. So not only do we have only four agreements around the world, but two of them, this and the Northwest and Sahara Conference, are very very rudimentary. Not to say that they're not important, but they're really just the first element to proper management. So the point I want to make here is that water security at global level needs to fully take into account the potential of groundwater. You have to really get your head around groundwater. You have to go talk to a hydrogeologist. You have to have people that work with groundwater. And from my side, law becomes quite important because any country that does have one of these transbandi aquifers that, is, that has the political will to start talking to its neighbor will want to have the emerging international law applicable to this specific natural resource in front of them to start a conversation. So it's very important to raise the awareness and to start a political conversation about transboundary aquifers. Now you may think, well, this is all fine, but is this really relevant for water-rich countries like Canada and so forth? Or at least some parts of Canada? And I would say yes. And the first reason is because Canada, many countries of the European Union, all of us have subscribed to something called the Sustainable Development Goals. And the Sustainable Development Goals apply to every single, of the, every single country whether you're Malawi, whether you're Bolivia, whether you are Canada. In a way, it applies to all in the same way. And SDG 6, the water SDG, says that by 2030, we have to secure access to all. Every single person has to have access to safe drinking water. But it's not just rhetorics. It's not just, well, OK, you say it, but then who cares? No. Water-rich countries such as Canada have to start doing efforts, have to start putting things in practice. So for example, what Lalita was saying, Canada will have to report back, will have to compile the efforts. And where does it bring these efforts? Actually, Canada, together with many other countries, has volunteered to start showcasing its efforts in 2018, next year in July, at the high-level political forum which is, if you want, the monitoring place of the Sustainable Development Goals in New York next July. So we'll start seeing how Canada is actually performing. But there's a second reason why water-rich countries should, very, should be very attentive at this. And this is because of the link between the SDGs and the fact that, as of today, we can say that water is a human right. But then, what does that even mean? I can go in the streets and say, what is a human right? But the practical elements of it, what does it mean? Does it mean that a, can a rich place like Canada in terms of water or Scotland has the obligation to send water to Yemen? No, it doesn't mean that. But it does mean that some characteristics of the delivery of water have to be present. Water has to be available, has to be safe, and it has to be accessible. If you think that because you have a human right to water, you're entitled to free water, according to international law, that's not the case. But it has to be affordable. So even water-rich countries have to think about that. But the interesting point that the UN Special Rapporteur, Leo Heller, on the right to safe drinking water has highlighted in two reports in 2016 and 17, 
is that countries like Canada have a further obligation, and this is towards water-stressed countries, and it's, in, it's within its international development agenda. Donors like Canada, like Germany, like Finland, and so forth, implement a lot of projects, be it in Peru, in Southern Africa, and so forth. In those projects, they have to consider the human right to water. And what that means in practical terms are elements such as do not put conditionality in those terms of the contract, in the terms of the lending, in the terms of the projects. And try as much as you can to bring sustainability to the issue and bring ownership to those countries that are water stressed. So with that, I finished, and I look very much forward to questions in the debate. Um, it occurs to me that um, we have a psychologist, a toxicologist, a journalist, and a lawyer, or someone working in the legal field, international law, uh, trying to resolve or highlight some of the issues in, uh, in water for us. And I think that that uh, says something about the complexity, and I'm sure we could have another half dozen professions up here talking about different uh, aspects of, uh, of water and water policy. Um, I would also be remiss if I didn't point out that uh, some of these people traveled a really far distance to come to talk to us today about water policy, and I really appreciate it, and I'm sure you do too. I'll present them gifts at the McKechnie Institute when we have the roundtable, but please join me in thanking everybody for coming to share their views.